Hey, Campfire crew, let's get it on. What Happened at Exit 40 by M. West In 1999, my mother and father were on a trip from Oklahoma to visit us in California. Along the way, they pulled over to change drivers. My mother called me and told me that my dad had a heart attack and had died along the roadside in Albuquerque. My brother and sisters picked me up after I finished working all night in Sacramento, and we traveled east in three cars. I remembered getting to Albuquerque in the morning, and I had just woken up and was ready to take my turn driving. I looked around thinking that this was the place my mother said my father died. Our three cars continued east as we were all chattering back and forth on the two-way radios, and occasionally we would stop for gas or a snack. We were cruising along at about 70 miles per hour as we approached Amarillo, Texas. I was driving the last car, when at speed, the engine just stopped. I repeatedly tried to call on the radio but couldn't get through the chatter. The other vehicles were soon out of range of the radio as I coasted off the freeway and into a Love's gas station on Exit 40. After some time, the other two cars realized I wasn't there, doubled back, and found me, so there were six of us together at the station. My brother and I looked at the engine, and there was nothing obviously wrong. We had gas, oil, and the car was fairly new. After some time, we were able to restart it, doing a little more inspecting of the engine. We continued our trip to Allen, Oklahoma, arriving that evening. We apologized to my mom for being later than expected and told her of our breakdown at Exit 40 in Amarillo. She told us, well, that's where your father died. I said, what? I thought you said he died in Albuquerque. She said, well, I may have when I called you. I was kind of out of it. I look back now at this and think, ghosts? Coincidence? Out of all the exits between Sacramento, California and Allen, Oklahoma, why that one? The event brought most of my brothers and sisters back to the very spot where my father died. I mean, what are the odds? New Year's Eve Insanity, submitted by Archer. When I was 21, I was in a really bad relationship with a girl I'd been with since sophomore year of college. I'm not going to get into why I stayed with her, but it was miserable, and to be honest, I stuck around way too long, even after I knew she had cheated on me. She begged forgiveness, and I gave it rather than kicking her bitch ass to the curb. <laughs> I was a moron. So, that year, our senior year again, she invited me to her parents' place an hour from my town, I'll call her Katie for anonymous purposes. We were going to have dinner with her family and then go to a bar with her friends. I had nothing better to do as most of my friends had plans with their boyfriends and girlfriends, so I just bought a bottle of wine and headed up to her place. I should stop and say I had nothing better to do as I had been invited to a co-worker's party, but I barely knew that co-worker. But again, I was a moron, hindsight being twenty twenty, going there would have been more fun and less dangerous. I got to her parents' house, and we hung out having some food before heading out to this bar with her and sort of my friends, too. It was loud, there was an obscene cover charge, but I was trying to make the most of the situation. As much as she was a bitch, I still kind of liked Katie. Everyone was having a good time until I lost Katie and didn't know where she went. Then one of our mutual friends, I'll call him Jake, grabbed me and said, Hey, let's go grab a smoke. We went to the end of the bar, and he looked at me for a minute and told me straight up, Katie was still playing me. I tried to stay calm and just had a butt and looked around the place. Jake elbowed me and nodded to his left. I turned, and there she was, sucking face with some guy. Shots on me, buddy, I said, and fired up two Jägermeisters. Jake went on to tell me how much all the guys that Katie was friends with wished I would just hang out with them and how they wanted to have fun without her. He texted all the other guys, and we started having our own party at the end of the bar. Katie finally came over to me, and three Jaegers in, I just told her to fuck off, 
It was over, and she could go hang out with the other guy. We were done. She screamed that I was an asshole and that I was ruining the night, and how was I going to get home? And she started crying and walked off. One of the guys, dude named Davis, told me to leave with him and I could crash at his place and get my car the next day. I accepted and ordered one more round for the guys, but for me, a Bacardi 151. While Katie was standing with her friends a few tables away, I childishly yelled, Hey, C-word, this one's for you. Put the booze in my mouth, grabbed my lighter, and fireballed it. Totally dangerous, totally stupid, and everyone but the bartenders in the place went crazy. They weren't too happy. It was only 11.15, but I wished everyone a happy new year, and Davis and I went outside. We got near his car, and that's when I was shoved right into the car from behind. It was the guy Katie had been hanging out with. He called me a fag and a pussy, and when I turned, he smashed a pint glass onto the side of my head. I dropped to the ground and put my hand to the side and pulled it back to see it was covered in blood. I'm sure the alcohol wasn't making it any nicer. Some other people pulled him back and Davis just ripped open the car door, helped me in and took off. Instead of going to the hospital, we went to a gas station. Yeah, real bright. I had a decent gash under my right eye that probably should have been stitched up, but we just got some ice and we went to his apartment. But not right away. I was holding a towel to the side of my head that was getting soaked with blood, and as we were driving, another car pulled up alongside us. Guess who? The guy who dry gulched me and his friends. Four of them. The driver started to try and force us off the road, and Davis did his best to drop back or get ahead, but they were so reckless it was making it difficult. I told him to stay to the right and ditch on the next street we could, and when he turned, it felt like we were going up on two wheels. Davis hit the gas, but the guys had finally turned around and were now following behind us after a few minutes. There weren't any other streets for a while for us to ditch onto and lose them, and eventually they caught up, and we heard a loud pop-pop, then the driver pulled up alongside us again, and that's when we saw one of the guys holding a gun. <laughs> Don't ask me what kind. How the hell would I know? He started to bring it up, and I put my hand on the wheel and swerved it over towards them. The driver panicked and hit the curb on his side of the road, smashed into a fire hydrant, and got stuck between it and a tree. Without a word, Davis jammed on the gas, and we were gone. We got back to his house, and his sister was the only one home. She was in college studying to be a nurse, and she took one look at me and got me cleaned up and then said, you need to see a doctor. So, there we were in the ER, and I ended up getting five stitches under my eye and 13 on the side of my head. I just told the doctor I'd gotten hit in the head by some nut at a party, and that was it. I don't know the names of those guys who chased us, shot at us, but I'm sure they all had some splaining to do when the cops eventually got there. There was no way people in that neighborhood weren't going to call about that. The next day, Davis took me back to my car and I drove home. But before I did, I got a text from Katie saying that she was sorry and to come to her house. I texted back, okay. When I rang the bell, her mom answered the door and said, oh my god, are you okay? Why didn't you come home with Katie last night? Katie and her dad had came up behind her and I just pointed to my banged up face and said, ask her, pointing at her. I turned around and that was the last time I saw any of them. I did hear them yelling at her as I left. Her parents were uber conservative, and Davis later told me that they made her transfer to a school closer to her town for her last semester of school, after she confessed to everything that had happened. Just desserts, toots. P.S. She tried to friend me on Facebook a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, no way. My Paranormal Stories, submitted by Jade Lighthouse. In March 2020, I took a little vacation to my sister-in-law's house with my boyfriend. I've only had sleep paralysis twice in my whole life, but this was by far the scariest time. I was laying down, falling asleep next to my boyfriend, and I was in that state where I was not quite asleep, but not awake either. Suddenly, I just jolted awake, and I'm not sure why. I realized I couldn't move my body and I immediately knew what was happening. I stayed calm, tried to breathe, and just let it pass. 
when I was looking around the room, I noticed a black shadow by the front door. It wasn't a human figure, just a black mist that was darker than the rest of the room. I started internally panicking and looked in the other direction. And just a few seconds after that, I heard a male voice that said, Your time is running out. I just closed my eyes and fell back asleep. I was so scared, but I'm not unfamiliar with things like this. I've had my fair share of strange experiences, and I know it's best to stay calm and not let your fear show. The next day, we all planned to go to a street fair. On our way there, a white van turned into our lane and crashed into us. Luckily, everyone was okay and nobody was hurt by the car that had crashed into the side where I was sitting. It literally rammed into my door, and that was the only damage on the whole car. I was the only one who came out with bruises. I remember what happened to me the night before, and I freaked the hell out. I mean, I was so shaken up and so scared to leave the house for days. I really thought my time was running out. I'm not sure what it meant, but it definitely meant something. I mean, maybe a warning of some kind. This is my little brother's story. I told him about your show and how you read our stories, and he wanted to share his too. So I'm just going to send this over to you word for word. It isn't scary, it's just a bit unsettling. One time, I was with our Aunt Sophie early in the morning before anyone was up, and I couldn't find my phone, so I asked her to call it. After a couple of times, it went to voicemail, and I found it directly under my pillow. When I answered it, a loud screeching noise played for like four seconds and then hung up. Since she was calling me, it couldn't have been someone being stupid and screaming into the phone. I still don't know exactly why that happened. All right, this is my last story. I think I came pretty close to being trafficked one time. I was about 14 or 15 at the time and was walking home from my boyfriend's house, and luckily I was less than five minutes from home. A man came up to me and said, Hey, I think someone's looking for you. Maybe a cop, but he wasn't dressed like one. I overheard him on the phone describing exactly what you looked like. I mean, he described everything you were wearing and said they were going to get you. I was really put off by this, and I was very creeped out. I thanked the guy, and he went on his way. And I looked around, and there were no cop cars in sight. Nobody who stood out that much. I walked home really fast and made it inside safely. And that was it. Nothing ever came out of it. It wasn't until years and years later when I put two and two together. I've heard so many other experiences of women almost being trafficked, and mine was sort of similar. I have no idea why that person was describing me on the phone and saying he would come get me. I'll never know, but I'm so grateful for the man who came and warned me. If he didn't, if I wasn't already close to my house, things could have been very different. Leaving My Friend's House, submitted by Harm Thuria. I was leaving my friend's place once. He lives in a locked apartment complex. You need to be buzzed in. As I was leaving, someone walked in at the same time, so I held the door for him, just to be polite. But the guy didn't thank me or anything. This was the first time. Every time I had let someone else in, they always thanked me, and I thanked them when I was let in. I've only been buzzed in two or three times at most. This guy gave me a bad vibe. I looked back to see him walk in, and then I saw a girl walk around the corner of the building, keys in hand. I walked towards her, not knowing how to tell her that she maybe shouldn't go in right then. But when I said there was a guy in a hooded sweatshirt with his hood up that just went inside before I saw her turn the corner, she stayed right where she was, frozen in fear. I told her to call her roommate or someone before going in. I hadn't moved either so she got the feeling that I had no ill intentions towards her. She called her boyfriend, whom she lived with. When he came downstairs, we heard him fighting with someone in the lobby. We went to the front door to see it was with that guy. She opened the door and I helped her boyfriend subdue him. It turns out, the guy was her ex and wanted to kill her. He was armed and the police were called. After they came and arrested the guy... And they took our statements, and the girl and her boyfriend thanked me profusely. She hugged me and began to cry on my shoulder. I'm never letting anyone in without being buzzed. <laughs> <laughs> 
ever again. Porch Pirate, submitted by Annex One. When my husband and I got married in 2019, my parents were in the process of moving to the South and considered selling us the house that I grew up in. It was a good neighborhood and we really liked it. And that was what we planned on doing, but we didn't have the money ready for a sale. So my dad just rented it to us until we could buy it. It was on a very quiet street in the suburbs of St. Louis. Great neighbors, just a really great place. I was a stay-at-home mom for my two kids, age three and one. My husband worked very hard at his job, and I worked hard at home to make sure our kids had everything they needed. I'd never heard the term porch pirate before, but I started to notice that things that I was ordering from Amazon or wherever were not showing up even though when I tracked the packages, they said that they'd been delivered. I asked some neighbors if they were experiencing anything like that, and they also mentioned that sometimes things went missing. My husband was getting tired of it and installed one of those ring doorbell things to see if we could see anyone coming towards the house. We did occasionally, and he did catch some guys trying to steal things, but that's not the story I want to tell. I appreciate your patience with the backstory. We both had hookups to the ring on our phones for that door camera, and one day I got an alert that someone was coming up on our porch. I happened to be in our nursery changing my one-year-old when the buzz went off on my phone, and I looked down, thinking maybe it was a friend or even my mom stopping by, but it was some strange guy I had never seen before. He was looking into our storm door and was actually trying to open it. I always locked the doors, including the storm door, when I was home by myself. So I watched him fiddle around with it for a second, and then I connected with him and said, Can I help you? He jumped back and then took off running. I figured it was just some person maybe hanging flyers for a local restaurant or something. That happens a lot in our neighborhood. No big deal. I don't think he had any idea how I knew he was there. And This was, at least in my recollection, the early days of these kinds of cameras. I could be wrong. I do remember he was wearing a gray hoodie over his head, and I didn't get a really good look at him. Again, oh well, I thought. At least I got him off the porch. The next day, I went shopping and came home and was unloading my groceries, while my three-year-old was watching Mickey Mouse, and my one-year-old was just hanging out in her high chair watching me and playing with some toys. My phone buzzed again, and I looked, and it was the same guy, I mean, the exact same hoodie. He was doing the same thing, jiggling the storm door handle, and then looking into or trying to look into the window of our garage right off the porch. I once again said, can I help you? Once again, he ran. I immediately called my husband and told him about the guy, and the fact that he'd been at our house twice, and now he was trying to look into the garage. He was getting the idea that he was trying to see if someone was home. This was in the spring, so I was frequently in the backyard with the kids. We had a large vinyl privacy fence all the way around it, so our dog could run around with us as well. We spent a lot of time out in the yard. Okay. This day, we spent a lot of time out in the yard before lunchtime and before I could get them ready for their afternoon nap. As I mentioned, I always lock our doors, but for whatever reason, I probably just had my hands full and I left the door to our backyard deck unlocked. My husband always tells me that he thought what had happened was not my fault, but I'm 100% sure it was my fault. After lunch, I got the kids upstairs into the nursery and started to settle them down with some books, and eventually they drifted off. I went into our upstairs bathroom and washed my hands, and that's when I heard something downstairs. I checked my phone to see if the doorbell had gone off, but it hadn't. I thought maybe it was the dog fooling around, but I remembered that I'd put him in the garage as he was a little crazy and often made it very hard for me to get my kids down for their nap. He is a big, gorgeous Rottweiler, but he is a little nuts. I'm glad he's the way he is, because he probably saved my life. I sat listening for a moment and could hear drawers opening downstairs and someone walking around on our hardwood floors. They were going back and forth from the kitchen to the living room, and it clearly was not my husband. I texted him, told him what was going on, said, I think there's someone downstairs in the house. He told me to immediately call 911 and let them know my concern. 
And I said, but how could I let them in if they came out here because I'm trapped upstairs with the kids? Anyway, I did call and was on the phone with a dispatcher while also trying to listen to see what was going on downstairs. They said they were sending someone out, but I told them that the front door was locked and I wasn't sure how the stranger, whoever it was, got into the house, not even thinking that I had left the back door unlocked. All of a sudden, everything got quiet, and I realized that this person probably heard me talking on the phone, even though I was whispering as quietly as I could. I started to hear footsteps coming up the stairs, and I opened the door to see the same guy in the same hoodie I'd seen before walking up my stairs with a hammer in his hand. I screamed, and he did his patented jump back, ran down the stairs, and made the mistake of the day. Instead of running back outside the door he had come through, he went into the garage. He ran straight into Archie the Rottweiler, who was none too happy to see a stranger in the house. I heard this guy yelling as Archie grabbed down to his arm and was doing his protective thing. Archie is a wonderful dog, super great with my kids and family, but he is very protective and he was doing his duty. Thankfully, my kids were sound asleep. Now I was on the phone with my husband again. The police pulled up into the front yard. I ran downstairs and flung the front door open, yelling that my kids were upstairs. Two cops came in, and I said, This guy's in the garage, and they could hear what was going on. Stuff was being knocked over, and the dog was going crazy on this guy. It was like an episode of Cops where I could hear them yelling to, Get on the ground, get on the ground, and all that stuff. They asked me to call for my dog to get him off this guy, and I did, and Archie, of course, came running to me. He had a large piece of hoodie in his mouth that was very bloody. This guy was screaming bloody murder, but he really wasn't hurt that much. He did get a couple of pretty severe bites, though. My husband was still on the phone and on his way home as they took this guy out and then asked me a bunch of questions. I told them I'd seen this guy in the ring a couple of times, but wasn't sure how he got in. One of the cops pointed to my back door that was wide open, and I started crying. I was in such a bad state that the other cop said, Um, I think you need to go up and watch your children. I had totally forgotten about them. Yeah, mother of the year. I ran upstairs, and they were still asleep. My husband finally got home, and they hauled that guy off. And apparently they knew who he was. And he was a frequent porch pirate as well as a burglar. He'd been arrested a number of times for breaking and entering into homes both in this neighborhood and others nearby. We did press charges, and I know he went to jail. My husband installed more cameras around the house to keep me safe while I was home with the kids, and I still feel so bad to this day that I forgot to lock the back door when I came inside. But I am so grateful that we had Archie, and that this guy had no idea what was in the garage. The cop said that he had the keys to my Acadia in his hoodie pocket, and they think he was going to try to steal my truck and make a getaway. Archie put a stop to that. Good boy. Hey gang, uh, I thought I would tell this story, and this is just completely raw, so this is not edited or anything, it's just me running my yap. Something that I hadn't thought about for quite some time God, probably almost 18 years or so, 17, around there, maybe something like that. Um, and I just thought of it. I was at my in-laws yesterday for Thanksgiving. It was awesome. I hope you had a good day, wherever you guys did. And um, so I'm recording it the next day after Thanksgiving. I, I came home and, uh, and I woke up, couldn't sleep last night for some reason. And I thought of this and I was like, boy, you know, I've never told this story. Um, my wife has never heard this story. I've never told my in-laws. This has always just stayed with me. Um, and my old dog, Lance the Paranormal Pup, rest in peace, little buddy. Hope you're running somewhere up in the sky with Daisy and all my other dogs. Um, and anyway, for whatever reason, I think our washer or dryer went out and we had to do laundry. And I knew my in-laws were on a... Uh, a vacation and this is, must have been September time it was fall I remember that um, it's been it's I'm getting old and shit gets foggy anyway um, we were gonna go up to their place and just use their you know washer and dryer and hang out and 
and, and do that. And um, we were newlyweds, so we, we made the trip up there. My in-laws live in like out in the middle of nowhere. Um, they live in a wonderfully cool house up by Lake Ontario, um, but they live way out in the country. And there's nothing but apple orchards on either side. And in the back, after they've got a very deep lot, they got a little cute little creek that runs by the house. The place is gorgeous. Um, there's a way to get back to some fire roads where it's nothing but cornfields. And the fire road goes back to this microwave tower. So uh, I was getting bored and thought, you know what, the dog needs to get some exercise. So uh, he's a golden retriever, by the way. He was. Um, he's not as big as my new golden retriever. And holy shit, my dog is big right now. He's only 11 months and he's nearly 80 pounds. But anyway, let's <laughs> see, this is just conversational. I'm going to babble. Please indulge me. So we get back to these uh, these fire roads that go right between two sets of cornfields. And, you know, it's it's they haven't taken them down. They have, they've you know, obviously cultivated, but the corn stalks are still up. They're this, like, all, you know, brown and, and dusty and uh, the, the soft winds blowing through. It feels like you're in children of the corn, so it is kind of creepy. But it was a gorgeous day. I'll never forget that. And uh, we're just running around. You know, Lance would run ahead, and every once in a while I would jump into the corn stalks, and then he would turn around to find me, and we would go zipping by because he didn't know where I was, and I would jump out and laugh, and we were just having a good time. So the fire tower is probably, or fire tower, the microwave tower is probably, uh, maybe, um, it's got to be two miles back. So we're getting closer to that, and I'm like, yeah, we better turn around. So I turn around, and... About 200 yards away, there's somebody standing in the fire road that I certainly didn't see when we went by. And it's just, it's like a black shape. I mean, I can tell it's a, it's a person. It's not, you know, Bigfoot or anything like that. Um, I can just, you know, it's standing there. And I'm like, I can't see or tell if he's looking away from me or if he's looking at us. Um, so I just say, all right, you know, pup, we probably ought to get going home. So we start walking. And as we're walking... Um, you know, Lance runs a little ahead. The guy just goes right back into the cornfields. And I'm like, well, that's kind of odd. Um, but then again, I'm like, maybe he's going to wait to, you know, spring out on me and yell at me for being out here because I didn't ask for permission. We just kind of went out there. So we get to where I think the spot is and I, I'm, I'm kind of slowing down and I'm like, should I put the dog on his lead? And I'm like, nah, you know, just in case, you know, he's, he's was a big golden retriever and he was extremely loyal. And, I'm, you know, as much as he wanted to just lick everybody and get his belly scratched, he also had a streak in him that he could he could be pretty aggressive. So, anyway, we get to this spot, and I'm kind of looking out of the corner of my eye because I'm not going to look right over. Um, but I'm, it, my, my heart kind of went into my throat because I, as I kind of turned, the guy was still there. And he's, he's wearing black pants. He's got, like, a black sweatshirt or coat on. I don't know, it was a Carhartt or whatever. He's got a black baseball cap, and I can't really make out what his face looks like, but he's standing maybe six rows in. So it's kind of difficult to see because you know how cornfields are if you've ever been in one, um, even though when the corn's all off and they're all, you know, looking ratty and shit before they pull everything out of the ground. Um, but I could see him. I mean, there's a shape there. And I kind of say, like, hi, you know, knowing that I'm busted because I, we're out here without permission. And, uh, and... I'd say, sorry, you know, I didn't ask. We're, we're out of here. We're, we're, we're going right now. And um, so I start walking. And we get a little ways away, maybe another couple hundred yards. And I turn around, and there he is again. Now he's standing in the fire road, and he's looking at me. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He's looking at me and my dog. So I'm like, okay, this is really freaking creepy. So I decide, okay, we're going we're gonna to step it up here. We're going to, you know do double time we're going to get back to to the house so we run for a little bit i turn around and he's no longer in the road and i can hear something in the cornfield though something is moving around in there and i'm like okay either it's him or it's a deer i mean there's a ton of animals out here um so i kind of turn and start running again and stop and i look off to the side and i can see him in the corn running alongside us. I never even heard him come up on us, but there he was. He, and then he stopped when we stopped and I'm like, okay, this is, this is effed up. This is, this has got to stop. So I get pup on his lead and we really, we bust out of there. We get to the, the T section of where the fire road then goes east and west, um, for full access to all the stuff that's out there. And, um, 
we've got a little bit ways to go uh, before apple orchard starts and there's a little area that you know you can go through between the apple orchard and my, my in-laws house alongside the little creek so i turn around and again and there he is standing at the little crossroads of the the two fire roads and um and i don't even i don't even know if they're actually called fire roads i'm not a farmer i don't know they're just access roads to get to all the stuff but i'll use fire road because it's it's an it's easy term to remember so He's standing there again, and I'm like, okay, this is really fucking creepy. Um, we get out of there. We get to the edge of my in-law's yard, get back to the house, get up to the deck to go back inside. And I turn around, of course, and there he is standing at the edge of my parents' yard in the apple orchard right next door. And I go inside. I'm like, I'm not saying, a sh I'm not saying anything to my wife. She's going to go nuts. My bride would freak out. Um... I remember we ordered pizza and just stayed inside. We're doing laundry. We ended up staying overnight. I think I think she fell asleep, um, and I was like, "Well, screw it. We'll just we'll just cack out here and uh, and we'll go home in the morning." But throughout the night, I would wake up, and they have a, a little well, room with a, a a big fireplace in the back, and there's windows that look out into the yard. And I remember going to the window every once in a while, just wondering if that guy was out there somewhere. Every time I went around, the, you know, the other other windows of the house or whatever, looked out on the deck, there was nobody there. And it was probably my imagination, but I could have swore I saw him in the yard. Um, but again, who knows? It was dark. I didn't turn the floodlights on. I did when I let the dog out and there was nobody there. Um, but yeah, so not the scariest of stories, but it was really, just at the time, it was creepy as hell. I remember asking my uh, my father-in-law, I said, hey, is it bad for us to be back there if we ever come around? He was like, no, nobody cares. He's like, "It's as long as it's not during, you know, where they're working or planting season, he's like, nobody cares if anybody's back there. He's like, we know those people, no big deal. I never told him about the guy. I never asked about it. Never told my bride. Um, but like I said, last night um, was just leaving their place to come back home. And, uh, and it didn't dawn on me until I did get home and I couldn't sleep that I was like, oh yeah, I remember that story. So anyway, a little bonus for you. Not the scariest thing in the world, but a little freaky. Never saw the guy again. Never brought it up. Maybe I'll ask my father-in-law sometime, um, if he knew, you know, anybody that would do that. Um, but yeah, so pretty creepy, but, uh, yeah, just wanted to share. All right. You guys be well and uh, look forward to you in the next episode coming up here shortly. Everybody, take care. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you would like to hear narrated on my channel, email UncleJoshTrueScaryStories at gmail.com. I read them all. Find me on social media. All the links to that are in the description below. And of course, if you haven't already, like, share, and subscribe to my channel and make sure you hit the notification button for every time that I upload. This is a tough one for me, as I just lost one of my oldest friends this past week due to COVID. He was unvaxxed, and I'm not going to make this a political thing, but if you're not, please do it. It took him unbelievably fast and another friend of mine is uh, spending this fifth week straight on a ventilator as well. I'm probably going to lose him too. So without going down any road to get people going back and forth about any of that shit, do the right thing, okay? Be excellent to each other. I love you, Brandon. I'm going to miss you. Rest in peace. Until next time, everyone. Be wary of things that go bump in the night. Could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.